Continuing on with the TMCC Library Outstanding Guest Speaker Series, today we are pleased to present Riley Aquan. I knew I was going to miss this up. Aquilante. <laughs> <laughs> Riley, Riley is the researcher at the Culture and Heritage Museum's Historical Center of York County, South Carolina. In 2016, she received a BFA in creative writing with her certificate in publishing and then a master's of library and information science with a focus on archives and special collections in 2019 from the University of North Carolina, Greensboro. This is in addition to completing internships at the Mint Museum of Art and the University of North Carolina, Charlotte. Today's presentation provides an overview of the resources and collections available at the Historical Center of York County with examples on how individuals can use them for their own genealogical research. So I'd like to offer a warm virtual welcome to Riley. Thank you. Yes, um, as she mentioned, my name is Riley Aquilani and I am the researcher here. So basically what that means is I am the first point of contact when somebody has to do research at our institution. So if you call or send an email, 80% of the time I'll be the one to respond unless I'm taking the day off for whatever reason. But um, throughout this presentation, I am just going to highlight some of the resources we have here. And by doing that, I'm gonna use some examples of when people actually came in asking. So uh, these examples are things I actually looked for other people. I'm sorry, our lights are a motion sensor. Um, so I hope that will help create a really good parallel for when you're doing your own research and if you ever have any questions in our region. So let's see. Yeah. Moment. All right. So York County, we are located in South Carolina. We are the very top of it, we are going to be, we have, we share a border with North Carolina, Mecklenburg County specifically. So some just, this is a very broad overview of York County. Um, the area was home of the Catawba, which is a Native American group. They are very prominent in the area and that's actually where a river in the county gets its name. So if you ever hear the Catawba River, that's gonna be in York County and sort of go up and down. Um, European settlers began coming to the region around the mid 1700s. And many of these settlers were of Scotch Irish descent from Pennsylvania and Virginia. So York actually gets its name from Pen the York in Pennsylvania. So you'll sometimes have people get us confused when they're looking for different resources because there is that connection of you had ancestors in Pennsylvania and then they came down to the York in South Carolina. York was also claimed by both of the Carolinas until a border survey in 1772. So with some of those earlier deeds and records, you'll see them being listed in Mecklenburg or some other area. That is still technically physically what is now York County. So you can have to maybe go up to North Carolina to look down here, depending on what time period you're wanting to look at. The Revolutionary War was also very prominent in this area. Two battles were fought. We had the Battle of Williamson's Plantation, which is also known as Huck's Defeat. This one's interesting because we actually have the battle site under our purview is known as Brattonsville. And that's because William Bratton was who participated in that battle. That was where he was living and it's also where it took place. And then we also have the Battle of Kings Mountain. Federal troops occupied York County during reconstruction because of the Ku Klux Klan. And this is something that we are currently very much trying to research ourselves and also to explain the story of. We have a exhibit that we put up not too long ago about reconstruction in York County. And then also in 1915, Yorkville, which was the county seat, changed its name to York. So now you have both York the town and York County. And they changed Yorkville because, um, fun fact, a local social club called the Crust Breakers, they thought the Ville made it sound too small. So they proposed a legislation to have people vote to remove it. So if you're doing any research prior to 1915, you're going to, Yorkville is the same as modern day York. All right. All right. And the historical center of York County, which is us. We are part of the Culture and Heritage Museums, and we are a very unique organization in which we are overseen by the county, but we're also a nonprofit, um, which is an interesting combination. 
in just a little history of us, in 1989, we opened as a repository for court records and also to preserve the cultural heritage of the Carolina Piedmont. And that is our mission statement today. So even though a lot of the material we collect is for Yark County, just based on our location, we also will do anything related to the Carolina Piedmont. In 1990, we received a major donation of genealogical records um, compiled by Joseph E. Hart. And we are gonna talk a lot about that later just because the Hart collection is something people will come and ask for by name. And then in 2014, we moved into our renovated location, which we are in now. And that is next to the McKelvey Center, which is another local landmark if you do research. It used to be a school and it dates back to a female college and then to an elementary school and then a high school. So, and I apologize for the PowerPoint having to go to the thumbnails. I'm not sure why it's acting weird. <laughs> so our search room is where you would come to do research. If you're able to come in person, if not, I understand. Um, we are non-lending. So even if you come, you can't check out books. Um, we could, you could also do a remote research request if you're not from the area or if you don't have the means to come and visit. You can submit by phone, email, letter, and there's even a form on our website. Um, we do have a base cost of $10 for the first hour and then $15 for any additional hour, but we will contact you if we find something that first hour and explain what we have and talk about any possible options going forward. And if you do come in person, however, these fees are waived except for the copies. And then also, if you have anybody in the area you know of who are trying to do genealogy but don't have the means to, we do offer Ancestry.com and Newspapers.com for free who anybody who comes in. So I have a local patron, she'll come in on her lunch break to use Ancestry. So we offer that as well. All right, so just talking about some of the things we have here. We have books, of course, we are a, a library. Um, so a lot of our books focus on the Carolina Piedmont with a focus on York County. We also have abstracts of early wills and deeds, which are helpful because some aren't available online, they weren't microfilmed, or honestly just the condition nowadays are harder to read. We have city directories, cemetery rosters, church histories, um, published and donated family genealogies. So we will have books that were formerly published by whatever institution. And then also we have a lot of just binders people gave us of their research and they wanna make sure that it's preserved and that it's out there in the world for anybody else doing research. So we accept that as well. And then we also have rare books. And these include school annuals and then anything that's out of print that might be relevant for local history. So I have a picture of a few books over there and it might be hard to see the titles, but these are some ones that I think are very interesting for York and we get requests about. Two of them are books by Brent Holcomb. If you're interested in South Carolina in general, I would look him up. He has a lot of books about a lot, he's transcribed a lot of material that could be deeds. Um, one is an early newspapers, marriages and death notices. And those newspapers I personally haven't seen online. So that is the only way I can look them up. So Brent Holcomb, he um, also does a, a publication monthly. So I would check that out. The other one is a guide to old York. This is a look book that was very recently published by the Historical Society, which is a technically a different institution than us, but we work with them a lot. And it talks about downtown New York, which is a historic district, but then also talks about history and a lot of prominent figures. So it's a very good way just to get an overview of the city. Um, the other one is by wagon, ship wagon and foot to York County, South Carolina. This covers several families and their genealogy. And I've had people ask for this one. There will be a list of what the, we, I, if you're curious, I can always give you a full list of what families are included in that book, but it's one I've been asked for a lot. Further in the back, you have the Millways of Kent. Um, the Kent series is interesting because in the early 1900s, around the depression, um, a, a bunch of college students and professors, they started doing a sociology study on a small town in South Carolina which was York. So, but for privacy purposes and for the study, they changed all the names. 
Sir York became Kent and certain families names were changed. But if you're familiar with the town and its dynamics, you can very much figure out what families are being mentioned and what locations are being mentioned. Millsways is good because it also just provides an overview about how mills in the South were run, which were very prominent in the early 1900s. So if you want to know about how life was had, maybe for your ancestors, that's a good one. You also, they also did um, Townways of Kent, which focused more on the quote unquote blue blood side of the town. And then also um, Blackways of Kent, which were for the African-American town. Then we also have Freedom on Trial. Um, this is another more recent book. Um, the author came here to research, and this is about the KKK in York County and what happened with that during um, Reconstruction. So that's very interesting as well, if you just like um, different historical stories. All right, going to the books, um, this is just a snippet of one of the directories we have. We have them for several different years and for different towns. Love is a very prominent name in York. And as you can see here, the way these ones are formatted is you have the name, then their spouse, and maybe where they worked and where they're living. So I like these because you can see both where they're living. If you wanna research their property, that's a very common question we have here. Where were they living? Do Who still owns it? And then also with their employment, you can go from that route to maybe research about in that institution, if it's a school, maybe their school has some things about them. So these are very helpful. All right. And this is from a very recent directory we got. Um, I processed it only at the end of last year. We like this one because, fun fact, there was a circus here in York. They would have their winter quarters. So they would tour throughout the spring and summer, then come back here for the winter. So a lot of the performers ended up setting up roots here, having families, um, getting married to local townsfolk. So this was the first instance we've seen where the circus quarters were listed in the directory. And here's an example of a rare book we have. This was a textbook that was used in York High School. And as you can see in the back, it has the names of whoever was having that book for the year. And again, I like this because it provides an insight into what your ancestor might have been learning, what they might have been studying in school. And also because we are a, we have a school next door to us that was operational, it helps us provide some exhibit work as well. And again, if you have any questions, just feel free to ask. All right, and now we are going on to deeds. Deeds are, again, are another something that people come here a lot to research, whether it's for their own family or even it's a property they bought and they want to know more about it, the history of it. Um, the deeds in your county can be a little convoluted, so I try to break it down so it's easier to follow. Um, we have the microfilm of earlier deed books here at the Historical Center. So that is from 1785 to 1977. However, if you're remote or you you want to be able to try to do it on your own from 1785 to 1950 that's all available on familysearch.org which i'm sure some of you are familiar with so if you are doing that earlier time period it's all available for free online if you want to do from 77 to 83 you will have to contact the register of deeds they haven't published that online and it, we don't have any copies of it ourselves However, if you're doing more recent, from 83 to the present, that's available on the York County website. So you can even search by surname, first name, and businesses. And that 83 date, it might be end up going earlier as well. Last year, it was 84. Last time I checked, it was 83. I'm not sure what rate they're digitizing them, but I'm hoping they'll be able to close that gap so everything you could find online. All right, for familysearch.org, again, some of this might be very familiar for you, but I'm just going to break it down for anybody who's new to it. Um, you just need to make an account. It is free. You don't have to pay for it. And when you're on familysearch.org to get to your county materials, you're going to go to the search and then catalog option. 
If you search by author with the author's last name be, being your county, South Carolina, then you'll get a bunch of different results. And these aren't just deeds, there's some church records. Um, I believe there's like a driver's license registration book. So if, you, if you're just wanting to get an idea, play around with them, there's some fun stuff. I think there's this whole little por portion of a coroner's inquest book. But if you're looking for the deeds in the drop down menu, you'll see the county court of clerk. And then you'll have two more options that will come down. Those will be conveyances, deeds, bills, and sales. And if you go to the conveyances link, link you will get to a list of deed books and their indexes. Unfortunately, these are just digitized images, so you can't keyword search. You're going to have to do it manually. So you're either going to pick the grantor or grantee. And a grantor is a person selling the property. A grantee is a person receiving it. So if you know whether they're buying or selling, you can narrow it down that way. Or again, if you just want to do both options and see what everybody owned, you could do that as well. At the index at the start of each letter, they'll have a page number. And it's at that page number, number you're going to find the details of the what page, what deed book page is on. So I got some images and I feel like it makes it make more sense. <laughs> so here's just a screen caption, a screenshot of what the page will come up if, if you search for your county information. So you can see your county, South Carolina, county court of clerk, and then the conveyances. And this example is showing to look for the Westbrook family. And again, this is a patron who came in wanting this information. So I helped them look up Westbrook. So if you go to that first link, you'll have the grantors and the grantees. And you're going to go to the first letter of that last name. The beginning, you'll have the index. where We'll show you, again, a page number where we'll have the more detailed listing. And in this one, they will have alternate spellings that are similar grouped together. So even if like here you have West Brooks and then you have West Brook minus the S. And I've seen the deeds in particular, the older ones, they were very bad and misspelling names for different people. I have a pair of cousins that come in. They know their cousins, um, but for some reason their fathers added an S to one name and one person didn't. So I find that helpful when they include all the different variations under one lump sum. And then here you'll see the more detailed listings. You'll see the name of whoever is selling or receiving the land, and that will be broken up by their first name. And then you'll see who they're receiving it from or who they are selling it to. And then the page book and page number will be on. And these deed books, again, are still on family search. They'll be under the same place that we looked at earlier. So again, we have a lot of maps. That's another resource we have in our search room. They are primarily of York County and surrounding areas, just given our location. We also have Sanborn maps, which I'll talk about in more detail in a moment. School district maps, topographical maps, road maps and atlases and land surveys. The road maps, I've had people come in here and look at older road maps just to kind of identify where a property used to be or where it is in relation to nowadays because we um, have had a lot of construction and development in this area in recent years. So things are very constantly changing. So here's an example of one of our more popular maps. It is a 1910 York County map. If you're familiar with Carhartt, the overall brand, and now just the general clothing brand. He actually had a plant here in New York County along the Catawba River. And you can see that he has a couple locations listed. You have Carhartt, then Carhartt Place. And we had a research coming in. She was writing a book about Carhartt and wanted to have a better idea of where the plant and his homes were located. And even today, if you go down to um, Riverwalk down by there, it's a, um, a new, relatively new residential shopping area. They have some hiking paths. You can find the remains of his house. Now, Sanborn maps. Sanborn maps, I really like. Um, Library of Congress houses some of these online, so you might not have to come to us, but if we can more than welcome to help you find them if you need them. 
And these aren't just for your county, these are for multiple um, locations. And as the Library of Congress puts it, um, these maps were designed to assist fire insurance agents in sort of understanding what the property was like. So they'll have details that normal maps would include. Um, like, like, like it says, doors, windows, what type of building it is, what street it's on, different physical um, landmarks. So you get a really nice detailed look. So here's um, one example of a Sanborn map. This one's from 1926. And this is just part of it, but this is for the Yorkville Graded School. And this is the building we have next door that we used to have operate out of. So if you see, it has a listings for heat and steam, um, electrical lights, and then also the auditorium and stage listed. And then further up down, you see the ballpark. So you get a very nice visual representation of what this building was like in that time. And we use this again to compare to older images of the building. So we could kind of identify, oh, when was this photo taken? Is the auditorium there yet? Is the stage there yet? Is, it, or is the building next door built or is it not? Because in, in 1926, there's not thing really located on the one side. So that can help us identify that. Um, here's another Sanborn map image. Um, this is for the church home orphanage. And this was an orphanage that was run in York for um, several years. And you see very detailed listings on this. You have the different, you have the names of the different cottages the children were living in. You have Martin College, Capers College, then also um, notations for the laundry building and then the dining room. So our, we also have multiple files as I'm sure many of you researchers have files of your own. So we divide them up by surname and education. Surname files are organized by last name, but we also have files on prominent individuals. And then our education are more generic topics like for specific schools, churches, cemeteries, that sort of thing. And these just contain miscellaneous documents that either we found during our research or the public has given us. So I like to use these as a very good starting point uh, because unfortunately some of them don't have sources or where these came from but others will. So this helps spark ideas and make those preliminary connections I'll use primary sources for to solidify. And newspapers. Um, I love newspapers um, very much because they show what is happening at that time and what the viewpoint of that time it was. Um, we have microfilm and physical copies of local papers generally from the late 1800s to early 1980s. Um, if you're at home and are interested, there are digital versions located on newspapers.com, which you do have to pay for, but Chronicling America is free through the Library of Congress. So that's a good alternative. And local papers that would be of interest are the Yorkville Inquirer, the Charlotte Observer, because even though that is in North Carolina, right across the border, you have a lot of families that will cross them very much. The Fort Mill Times and then the Herald, which is for Rock Hill, South Carolina. So archival collections, and this goes more into like what we do. Um, we house court records, social club records, family papers, business records for store ledgers, photo collections, and church records, and these are for local organizations and families. We are primarily a donation-based institution, so if you are looking for something and we don't have it, unfortunately that means it just wasn't donated to us, but you can always check other institutions nearby. So going into more in depth about how archival collections work, these are our primary resources mainly. So these will be the old things that people love to check out and to have all the cool juicy information. So to process of collection, we will have a donor signed paperwork. This will include a temporary custody form and then a gift agreement. The temporary custody form just gives us temporary ownership and we'll use this to sort of put a we temporarily own it while we do our research and see what the value to our institution would have. 
And then once we decide, yes, we definitely want it, we will send them a gift agreement to sign and that will permanently transfer ownership. In order to properly um, store the records with the rest of our materials, we will isolate and free them um, for a time. Isolation takes longer. We will put them in Ziploc bags like you see in the photo for a couple months. And if we freeze the item, that would only be for a couple weeks. Now doing this, this would kill any mold or bugs that might be on the papers or books. And this is actually something you can do at home if you have any family memorabilia that you wanna make sure is not cr crawling with anything or if you think might be having some mold grow on it. Um, you can just put it in a Ziploc bag and make sure all the air is out of it and then put it in the freezer for a while or just keep it in that Ziploc bag for several months. And you can use regular Ziploc bags, but they also sell acid-free ones online depending on how in depth you wanna go with the archiving process. And that's just something that you can do to make sure it is there for the next generation. After we start processing it that way, we will do the justification. And this is where we research the items. Who owned it? Why is, why is it important? Why do we want it? And we'll present this information to our board of direct, and we will, they will give us a final send off of yes, you can officially accept this donation. And in my time period though, nothing has been declined because usually we know what we want and we'll tell somebody up front, we're not, we unfortunately can't accept this. It doesn't meet our mission statement or yes, we definitely want it. We will then assign it an accession number so we can identify it later. We will organize and rehouse them into archival boxes like you see, and those are acid free. And then we will create a finding aid. So we can look it up later and we can also share that information with the public. So this is an example of something in our archival collection. It is for the Rainbow Home and Gar Garden Club. I had an individual come in, she knew her grandmother was involved with this club. So she wanted to see materials for it. And we actually had this yearbook they created and her name, um, Mrs. Frank Coleman was included in it right here. And this one, she really liked this one because it was a hand-drawn cover. And you can see the pen and it was hand stapled. So we have those sort of materials in our collection. Now our, a big portion of our archival collection is the York County records. And we have several different versions of them. There are general sessions and these are our criminal cases. You're gonna have your murder, your larceny, all the bad stuff. Um, and then there's court of common pleas. These will be the civil suits. So if somebody's suing um, for property, debt, um, estates, you'll often see family members suing each other for inheritance. Then you have coroner's inquest. This will um, examine the manner of death. They'll usually have the coroner come in, but also maybe a group of people to sort of rule on whether it was natural, murder, whatever. Um, unfortunately, we have an incomplete run. There are the inventories and appraisal books. And this is a list of personal property usually involved with estate settlements. So you'll sometimes see that, you'll sometimes see a page from that mingled in with other family research that somebody has found. Then will books. And these are also on microfilm. So you might have actually seen pages of these online. I've seen some people from Ancestry post those because I also believe the archives in South Carolina has a copy of the microfilm. But if you ever need reference to that, we can also help you. So going to, again, the examples, I had a patron come in last year. She had seen a snippet of this newspaper article online regarding her family. Um, it was a poisoning case where a stepmother allegedly murdered her husband and then three of her stepchildren. However, her, the patron who came in, her ancestor was a fourth child who was poisoned but survived, much to everybody's surprise. So she wanted to find the full article that talked about the court case and then also anything else we had on it. So I helped her find the rest of the article. We were able to find it in the Yorkville Inquirer and it talked about the trial and the process and what happened and the background basically. But then 
in our records, we have the actual court case. So these are just a couple documents from it. We have a whole file. You have the arrest warrant for the witnesses. And then you also, it's very hard to, and it's very faded, but you can still read it. It has the list of witnesses. So we have the doctor, um, AJ Anderson, and he was included in the article talking about who came, he came and examined the children, the husband, when they first got sick. So you get to sort of have those two points of references with the newspaper article and then the court records that help fill in any gap or what might think was um, left out in the newspaper just because of limited space or all that. And then plus these were the original documents. So it's very amazing to be able to hold those and see those in person. So that was an example of um, general sessions where it was a criminal case. And we also have the common pleas cases as well. And here's another example that we had to look up before. This was for a Bratton. And as I mentioned before, we have Brattonsville. That is a part of the Culture and Heritage Museums. It is a living history farm. So if you're ever interested, you'll see um, recreations. Um, we have original buildings. But because it was owned by the Bratton family, anything involving the Brattons, we take a special attention to. So um, I had somebody come in, ask about Fanny C. Bratton, came across this. And she was the defendant for a court case involving the Bank of Chester. And then I look in our records and I was able to find documents related to that. Um, this one is interesting because you actually have a snippet of the very article we saw in per, uh, the physical copy that was cut out with a notice saying they placed it in the Yorkville Inquirer to advertise. And it was in for six successive weeks and when it began publishing and when it stopped. So it was her summons to come to the courthouse. Then you also have the paperwork, the order. Um, and in the, in the file, we have a detailed description of what happened, what was being claimed. And this is helpful again with family members and genealogy. If you have conflicting reports about, oh, they got this lien from this, or, or they got this piece of something from this, or that somebody was in debt to this. So this can help even list family members. And I found this helpful when you're trying to figure out why people are related. All right, the heart collection. I mentioned this at the beginning. This is a very popular collection. Um, I've had people come in from New York and even Alaska and ask for it by name. It is um, over 75,000 families in New York compiled by Joseph E. Hart Jr. He was a genealogist in the area. He created this mainly during the 1950s to the 1980s. So prior to the internet and really anything electronic, he used his own system to catalog these records. So they're very unique in how he formatted them. He used census records, cemetery inscriptions, newspaper records, Bibles, correspondences, um, just, and even just talking to family members to compile this. However, the most frustrating part is he did not actually cite his sources. So again, I used to like to use this as a great starting point to help identify who this person is, who their parents might have been, who their siblings might have been, who they might have been married to, and then be able to search for those surrounding names and see if there's any connection in any other document. So this is an example of what Hart compiled. Again, he has his own unique system. He lists each individual by a certain code. In this example, William Brown is listed as BF. So then each of his child is also given a unique identifier. So for example, Elias is listed as A, so William Bratton is BF, so then Elias is BFA. So when Elias has his own page, that's what his um, identification code will be in. But then you could also see Hart has listed um, who they're married to, if who um, where they're buried, if he knows. So again, this is a great way of seeing those surrounding names that might be associated with that individual you're looking for. Because his handwritten works are very 
unique and sometimes be hard to decipher. We compile them all into a family tree maker, and this might be a program some of you are familiar with. Um, when you're coming to ask for something from the heart collection, we will send you something from Family Search, I mean, Family Tree Maker. There are multiple different reports we can make for this. We can do ancestry, we can do to his descendants, we can do individual reports. Um, something I find very helpful is there actually an option to see how two people are related if they're in the system. So if you know, for some, if for some reason you know, William Brown's related to John Smith, but you don't know the details, you could put both those names in and Family Tree Maker will create a report detailing how they're related. And we will, again, coordinate with you on this, what kind of reports will best suit your research needs and go from there. The Southern Revelry Award Institute is um, a part of our institution as well. Sometimes we'll think it's a separate entity. No, it's in our building. So if you've heard of it, it's right in here as well. It was established in 2006 and it was mostly built off the Bobby G. Moss Revolutionary War Collection. Bobby G. Moss was a local historian and when he passed away, we received his works. And this institution, has primary secondary research for the Southern campaign of the American Revolution, not just South Carolina, but the Southern campaign. So if you have any Revolutionary War ancestors that you're looking for information on, this is a great resource. We have books, microfilm, files. Um, our historian, Zach Limhouse, operates it, and he has worked with multiple individuals on doing DAR, Daughters of the American Revolution applications, Sons of the American Revolution application, and so if you're looking for that, he is familiar with the process and he's a great resource. All right, and uh, this is something we get asked about a lot, so I've thrown it in here. Um, we unfortunately do not house vital records and these would be birth certificates, death certificates, marriage records, et cetera. And when I say we don't house them is we don't get a, we don't have a direct funnel where we receive them from like the county or the government. If we have any in our collection, they were donated with another collection or um, from a family or personal papers. So if you're looking for that, I would recommend Ancestry depending on the depending on the time period. If it's older, it might be on there. If it's something more recent or you can't find online, you would go to the South Carolina Department of Health and Environmental Control. And here's just a little screenshot of their page and see what they can offer. Um, you will have to do form, and I believe there might be a fee, but they can, they're they um, great at helping with that as well. All right, and here's just a summary um, of where you can reach us. We can, we have our address. If you want to call, my direct, direct number was at the beginning of the presentation. This is our general line, and you can press option two. Um, you can email us. We have our website, which you can more welcome to explore. With our court records, um, going back to those, we are trying to get an online index ready. We are just waiting on IT to kind of flesh that out. So if you're in the future wanting to see if you have any court records related to your ancestor here, you can go to this website and then go to the Historical Center and it will be hosted there. And if you want to talk to anybody or come in a visit, if you happen to be in the area, we are open from weekdays to 10 to 4. And if anybody has any questions, I'm more than well, help you, happy to answer. And thank you so much. Thank you, Riley. Um, <laughs> class, do you have any questions? Go ahead and unmute your microphone. Yes. Um, could you please re um, repeat the title of the book that had about the migration to New York County? I think it started with By Sea. And then I um, by ship, wagon, and foot. By ship, wagon, and foot. Okay. To your county, and, yes. Okay. Do you have an author? Um, let me check real quick. Thank you for the title. No problem. I, I'm just used to grabbing off the shelf so much. I'm like, oh, who is the author? Um, it is George Bowman Hartness. H A R T or K. Um, H-A-R-T-N-E-S-S. -S. Thank you. Anybody else? 
Well, we're waiting, while we're waiting, uh, Riley, I have a couple of questions myself. Um, yes. I know the in Southern California, um, there's a large genealogical association called the Southern California Genealogical Association. And they it took them several years, but they reconstructed the lost 1890 census uh, for that area of California. Um, have you been involved with any local societies or has your institution been involved with any local societies to reconstruct the local lost 1890 census? Not that I'm personally aware of. Um, I know there's other institutions in the area as well, but um, as far as I'm aware, we haven't. Okay. Now, I, I, want, I want to refer back to that one slide where you talked about um, how to drill down and you said do an author search using York County. That was really interesting to me because as a librarian, you know, I, I, I you know, spend a lot of time about how to do the best searching, but I've never heard anyone say to use an author, an author search for a place. So that was a, a real quick little uh, tidbit that I, I plan on following up on to see if that you know, uh, actually drills down faster for people. So thank you for, for sharing that because I never would have thought to do an author search for a place. So um, great idea. Uh, yeah, now you... um... Oh, go ahead. <laughs> Sorry, you're good. Um, yeah, yeah, I think I can't take for credit for that. Um, one of my coworkers showed me that, but it's helped, but it's used for like what government records when the place is creating it, so to speak. Understood. You no, know, I mean, yeah. it makes perfectly good sense in my mind, but I'm sitting there thinking, wow, you know, my goodness. Okay. Um, now you talked about school district maps. We have had a lot of speakers and certainly I've attended a lot of conventions and classes over the years on tons of different kinds of maps, but I've yet to have, you're the first guest speaker I've ever had that talked about school district maps. Can you give us a little bit more information about what is a school district map and, and how it can relate to doing your genealogy? Yes. Yeah, so um, for your county, um, the whole county itself it is divided up into multiple school districts, and this is true even to today. So um, York, the, the town and its immediate area, that's school district one. And even in the past, they still kept those district ideas. So we have older maps where you'll see just a big old number sort of dividing up an area, and that number will correlate to the school district. And this is helpful for if you know you have a general idea where their school might have been located that you can also search by district in the newspaper or different records because it was under that sort of umbrella of a location. So sometimes um, records won't refer to an individual school, but rather school district six or school district 47. So that is the maps are helpful with understanding what area of the county that number was associated with. So if you had a school district map, can you drill down further and find like what students were attending school or what teachers were the instructors, you know, uh, during a certain year? Um, in other words, is there a way to take that map and extrapolate down further and drill down further to find their ancestor? <laughs> you can work, definitely work from that. Um, I have done research through the newspapers and I reference the newspapers a lot, but I love them. Um, well, they'll do a school report annually where they will have the different districts listed, and then it'll also list teachers in that district. So you can always, if you know they might have been a teacher in this general area, okay, let me check their school report for district six. So you can maybe go from that direction. And then also the district maps will sometimes show the individual schools of that time period as well. Okay, but by any chance do you have a list of students? No, they don't include students. This is just okay. um, a map of the county showing the districts and the locations. Understood, okay. Mm -hmm. Now you mentioned on one slide, the orphanage. Um, yes. Once again, you know, knowing that there's an orphanage is one thing, but do you have a way of drilling down to find out, for instance, who were the children in the orphanage or who were the employees working at the orphanage? Yes, um, they, are, they are listed on the census records for um, those years it was operational and it will list like matron or unfortunately inmate for the children living there, but we also have the records from that institution because it was also a military, it was called Kings Mountain Military Academy. It was a private school before it was converted into the orphanage. And then later it was um, known as York Place, which was another sort of therapy institution. So we got all the records from that. So we actually have a book that lists um, children that were living there during a certain time period and also listed their age 
Um, so that's one option. And then there's also a book that was published. Um, it was the Episcopal Church Orphanage was the full name, but they did a bunch of research on who was living there, who was um, operating it. So if you're interested in that, that's a good read. Wonderful. Okay. Now you, you have one slide about archives. Um, we were just, it's just kind of interesting that you had the slide on archive because I think it was just last week in class, we were talking about archive grid, you know, about how to find personal papers in archives all over the, the world, basically, especially in the United States. But um, are you on archive grid? We are not, unfortunately. Um, but um, if you, we are working on getting, um, we have used Pack Perfect software. So if you have anything you're interested in looking up, we can certainly send you a record up from that. Okay, but they can search the archives through your website or not? Not currently, unfortunately. Oh, okay. We are that is something we're getting up, and we will soon have our court records database online. Great, yeah, because I mean, it, the the wonderful thing we discussed last week is that those family papers um, might exist, or um, you know what, actually, you know what, I'm, I'm just thinking, you know what, it was last week, but it was at Roots Tech. I took a class at Roots Tech that was talking about how you can, how she found, um, the, the presenter found her ancestors' death record that they had been looking for high and low for many years. They couldn't find it in anything rec related directly to the family, but they found it in the movers and the shakers of the community. They researched who were like the doctors, who were the preachers, yeah. you know, who were the, um, you know, the representatives, government representatives. And then they took those surnames, ran them through archive grid and found the papers. And lo and behold, in the paper, there was a, a mention of this particular person who was not related to them, um, you know, who actually wrote yeah. the documents, but they had noted that this person had died on the, in this town on this date. So um, that was just a wonderful little tidbit. So, you know, archive grid is really high on my radar this week as a result of that. So anything to do with archives, you know, is, is very, very keen on my mind. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Now um, you mentioned that the heart collection, that you had put all that information out of that collection into family tree maker. My gosh, that must've taken <laughs> you forever. How long did that project take? That that was done before I joined the institution, um, but I know it was definitely a big undertaking. They had volunteers and interns working on it for a long time. My goodness. I just, I mean, <laughs> I've worked on a lot of projects over the years. And when you said that, my mind just was, I was amazed at how much time and effort that must have taken. Because mm -hmm. like you said, it was a personalized indexing system that he had. So understanding that system and deciphering that system must have been quite time consuming. Yes. Um, and there's some people here that can read it, look at split, and the rest of us sometimes have to take a whole minute if we're looking at the physical copies to understand it. Oh, my goodness. Okay. So tell me, what is a typical day in your archive? You know, who's coming in? What, what is the typical um, everyday kinds of questions you get? We definitely get a lot of genealogy questions, um, people who are looking for their ancestors, but then also um, land records. Um, as I mentioned, we'll have people who move to the area and buy a house. Uh, we have a historic district here in New York. So if somebody goes into a historic house, they often like to know the history behind it and maybe see some of the older deeds um, online or if we have anything associated with that family that lived there. We also do in-house research for our own projects. As part of the Culture and Heritage Museums, we have our site, but then there's also the Museum of York County, which is more natural history, which is what our collection staff works with closely. Then there's also the Children's Museum and then Historic Bradensville. So we will assist with any um, in-house projects we're doing, any potential exhibitions or any new research that comes up that way. And then we'll have people who are just researching the town itself. I've had, I had a lawyer from Chicago um, email me once looking for a court record we had because he was trying to do a, fancy legal word where he was setting precedent that was used for that court case. And then we, for example, we had the author who came down to research the KKK in York County. So while we do mainly deal with, again, the local stuff, genealogy, land, we do get occasionally those really interesting, oh, I'm working on this book, or oh, there's this rare thing that I heard you had that I want to look at. I know the, the DAR uh, obviously a nationwide organization. Um, I know they have, they're very big into the America 250 project that's going on right now yeah. nationwide. Are you working with any local DAR chapters on the, on the upcoming 250th birthday? 
Yes, our historian Zach Lemhaus, who runs the Southern Revolutionary War Institute, he is working closely with local organizations and even the state to prepare for that. Wonderful. Yeah, I'm I'm on our local America 250 um, committee for my chapter for the DAR, so that's good to know. Um, yeah. It kind of gives me some ideas too about where I want to go to to help you know uh, make our celebration bigger as well. So, okay, um, class, do you have any other questions for our guest speaker? Yes. Um, uh, if we had questions about the Southern, what's available at the Southern Revolutionary War mm -hmm. Institute, we should contact Zach Glimhouse? Yes, ma'am. And then, of course, I can um, forward anything you get to you. I can maybe help you as well. But he is very much the expert on the revolution in the, in the South. Okay. And it is part of your historical center? Yes, we are. Um, it's... It's sort of like a little egg, like a Russian egg, where he is a part of our overall organization. Okay. Um, I was had the misconception, or maybe it was before, that it was part of the McKelvey Center. We are the McKelvey Center. Again, oh, it's, okay. um, yes, it's um, a confusion even locals have, because next door is the McKelvey building. That was what the school was. It used to be um, the McKelvey School. And we used to be housed there, and now we are right next door, but we are still considered like the McKelvey campus. Okay, so the McKelvey, yeah. that building is not, doesn't have the records anymore. You have them. No, we have the records, and we're okay. overseeing that property, but now we use it. Um, it's under um, renovation right now for structural issues, but okay. we use it for um, exhibits and performances. Okay, that helps clear up my confusion. <laughs> okay, anybody else, class? I have a, a question. Um, you mentioned that uh, in your vertical files, you had files for surnames, and then a section on educational files, um, and then a, a category of miscellaneous. What's in the educational files? Um, no, our, we have two separate um, files, education and surname. Now, these contain documents that we, I call miscellaneous. There's no set standard of what's in those files. They will just be documents either we find through our research or people have given to us that we might be useful. So we will put them in those files for people to reference later. So we don't actually have a mis miscellaneous section. Oh, okay. Um, yes. The Hart collection um, emphasized, uh, you mentioned that he did this in the 1950s. So yes. did he include African-Americans in um, his recordings or, or not? Unfortunately, he did not. If um, he did, I have yet to see it. And as far as I know, nobody's come across an individual who was African-American in there. So that is an unfortunate missing link in there. Oh, okay. The, the next is um, school district maps. Um, because of segregation, um, we can assume that uh, certain schools were exclusively black. So my question is, once you can locate, or I think you locate a, an African-American school, mm -hmm. it does, um, where would you go uh, for um, information about um, uh, yearbooks? and about employees at particular schools that you may know your ancestor went to? Would it be the Board of Education of York County or how do you find that information? Unfortunately, I don't know if the board, if the school board has retained that, but um, some of the maps we do have identify African-American schools. And again, the newspapers, again, sorry for harping on them. I know the Yorkville Inquirer will list information about colored schools in its annual report and who was teaching there. And sometimes they'll also include salaries, which is interesting because you do see that disparity between the different types of teachers. But I would recommend going that route. Thank you. Okay, class, anyone else? Just give it a few seconds. <laughs> Okay, well, if nobody has any further um, questions, Riley, uh, before I say goodbye, I want to thank you not only very much for doing the presentation today and sharing your expertise with us, but also for allowing us to record. That was very, very nice. So it'll take a few weeks before our 
uh, marketing department gets this up on our YouTube channel. Um, but Riley, once again, thank you very, very much. And before you leave, uh, let me tell the class if there's anything in the chat box that you would like today, before you leave the class, make sure to download the chat box because if you forget to do it and then you decide you wanted it after all, if you've logged out and you log back in, you will not have access to the old chat box any longer. So if there's anything in the chat box, this is the time to download it. And you do that by clicking on the three little dots in the uh, bottom of the chat box. Or if you don't can't find the three little dots, you can go ahead and... Uh, just copy and paste everything. And uh, also, I want to let everyone know before we say goodbye to, to Riley, uh, the class does go on for a couple more hours and everybody is welcome to stay. Uh, but at this point in time, Riley, I, once again, I'll say thank you. And if you'd like Suzanne, to say goodbye to the class, oh, go ahead, Marilyn. Uh, Suzanne, I had one quick question. I'm sorry, I was trying to get to my mouse. Um, <laughs> uh, what percentage of the uh, documents that you have are digitized and um, indexed? We unfortunately don't have any current in digitization pro programs right now. Um, as for indexed, if there's something you're interested, a topic you're interested in looking for, we can look for, through our records and send you anything we have. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yeah, Riley, that's a, a common question because you know since we are so far away from your facility, of course, digital yeah. access is so you know so important to so many people's research. Yes, um, but again, um, we work with a lot of people from apart across the country. Um, we even had a researcher from Canada contact us once. So we are more than willing to work with anybody who's at a distance. Wonderful. Okay, Riley. So with that, I'll say thank you. And uh, we really appreciate your time today. And I will stop the recording at this point. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.